Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Terry Becker's 2023 Government and Public Sector Virtual Conference. My name is Danny Martinez, and I'm a Managing Director in the Government and Public Sector Advisory Group, and I lead our Accounting Advisory Team. It is so great to see over 1,000 people registered from over 35 states who have decided to spend a large part of your next two days with us. You know, this conference continues to grow, and we've worked very hard to deliver engaging content for you as part of being your guide forward here at Cherry Becker. Uh, one of the things that's special about Cherry Becker is our commitment to the government and public sector. It really is at the core of what we do, and I believe that you're going to see the breadth and depth of our experience here uh, during this virtual conference. I'd like to quickly thank our production and marketing teams for all of the work that they do behind the scenes uh, to make this happen. A uh, big shout out to our marketing lead, Ashley Prusek, for all you did and all of your assistance in pulling this uh, together. We have eight great sessions planned uh, over the next two days, and we'll, we'll, we will be offering up to one hour of CPE uh, per, ses per session. T today's ad agenda is comprised of four sessions. You know, we're going to have the GASB update. We're going to talk about operating a government and accounting finance function after the Great Recession. We'll look at the finance function of the future and uh, digging into some cost allocation uh, important topics. And lastly, we'll end with a, one of our um, uh, external speakers, Results for America, who will talk about embedding data and evidence into government programs. And again, there'll be four more sessions tomorrow. So if you have not yet registered, please click on the link in the chat to update your registration. Um, each session will be led by professionals who will be providing tools, tips, and actionable techniques regarding these topics. And so uh, you know, just sit back and relax. We really hope you enjoy the eight session over the next two days. I have some housekeeping things uh, before we get started. Uh, first of all, to receive CPE credit, you must answer at least three polling questions and attend for the full 50 minutes. CB CPE certificates will be issued via email within 10 days. If you have not received yours after 10 days, please email cbhlearning at cbh.com. A recorded version of this webinar will be available in about one week and will be sent via email along with a copy of the PowerPoint slides and it will also be posted to our website. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into our Q&A window located in your control panel. We will either get to them during our presentations or respond to you via email after the presentation. I also want you to note a short survey will be posted at the conclusion of the webinar. We truly value your feedback and we ask that you take part to help us to continue to uh, improve uh, on these virtual conferences. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speakers. Uh, we have Scott Anderson, Director of Assurance Services with Cherry Becker and Jack McKee, Advisory Services Manager. And they'll be providing an overview of the accounting and reporting requirements of recently issued GASB standards and the likely impact of GASB's current projects that are anticipated to become new standards uh, in the future years. And so with that, uh, Scott, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you, Danny, for that introduction. So happy to be here. Welcome to everybody for joining our GASB update. Um, excited to talk about all the great things that are happening at the GASB. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. And it's always tough when fitting a GASB update into a one hour session of determining what it is we should spend our time on. And sometimes we get feedback that we should only focus on uh, issued pronouncements that are being implemented. And sometimes folks wanna hear more about what GASB is currently deliberating on and thinking about. And, and we're gonna do a little bit of both. We're not gonna do a deep dive of really any of these issue standards because the good news is all of these pronouncements that you see on here were the same pronouncements that are out there last year when I gave the same GASB update. So I think you've heard a lot of good information already and we're gonna hit the highlights. I wanna tell you things that you should be thinking about, how you can know if these gui this guidance applies to you and if it does apply to you, what are some important things to think about and where you should go to get more information. Um, and then we will touch base um, on some of the projects that are currently outstanding. And here's a list of those. Now, if any of you have attended a session or webinar uh, this spring or summer with Joel Black, I attended the one, uh, the, the GFOA in, in Portland this year, he made it a point to compare the current list of GASB activities with that list in 2020, specifically the projects that are being worked on, the pre-gender research. And his point in doing so was to point out that uh, it's a smaller list now. 
Uh, they had a lot more things going on in 2020, and intentionally, they have let that list um, slow down, dwindle down as projects have been issued to not replace them. Um, and that was in response to some of the feedback from, from you, from stakeholders, that uh, Gatsby just needs to slow down and let us catch our breath with some of the things that are being implemented. And so, um, as you can see from this list, they, they have a few projects. In the next year, there's probably going to be three new pronouncements. Um, but they aren't adding too many others to that list. Having just said that, they did finish their subsequent events uh, pre-agenda research, and that will be something that they will decide on the next technical uh, agenda, whether or not to pursue a project there. Um, having read the research memo, I will tell you that users of financial statements found the subsequent event information very useful. Uh, and at the same time, they found that preparers did not apply 56 consistently. And so when you combine those two things, you have a recipe for a new pronouncement or new project. So I, I expect that subsequent events will become a, a, a new project, but there aren't any other pre-agenda research um, projects that are lined up behind that one. So uh, they have indeed slowed down. Um, now, with that said, um, with that introduction, we're going to do our first polling question early here. Um, and this is the question, what are your thoughts on the GASB technical plan? Uh, it's perfect. Moving in the right direction, not enough projects or missing important topics. I guess I should have put an option on there. Too many projects still. We'll give you just a minute or so to answer some of those questions. As we wait for some of these options, uh, these polling questions to be answered, I did also want to say that GASB did issue a new implementation guide uh, last month, which wasn't listed on either of those slides, but those that, that implementation guide does provide some, some good resources, um, some questions about leases, question about SPEDA, and a question about GASB 100. All right, can we go ahead and share the results of that poll? It looks like most of you believe that uh, the GASB is moving in the right direction with their technical plan. Um, and then, of course, if you do believe not enough projects are missing some important topics, uh, I, I can tell you they've got a list a mile long of potential projects. It's just a matter of deciding which one's the most important and can be addressed in a manner that would be um, effective providing essential information to users, but not putting too much of a burden on preparers. Well, the first topic that we are going to address today is GASB Statement 91, Conduit Debt Obligations. Now, conduit debt is not that common, uh, but it's also not rare. Um, I see it a few times a year. We have uh, several clients who have conduit debt obligations. And the reason why the GASB took on this project and issued this statement was because the only other guidance on conduit debt obligations was Interpretation 2, uh, which was issued in the mid-90s. And that interpretation provided some good information. It provided a definition of conduit obligations, conduit debt obligations, and then it also provided some disclosure requirements. Uh, one thing that it did not do was to provide any accounting or financial reporting guidance. And in fact, paragraph four of implement, Interpretation 2 says, some issuers of conduit debt obligations currently report them as liabilities on the balance sheet along with related assets. And so you're seeing two ways of accounting for it. Either you, an issuer doesn't report conduit debt at all, or they report a liability with a, a receivable. Um, sometimes you'll have an issuer report the conduit debt, and then you'll have the obligor also report the conduit debt. So there is some disparity in how these were being accounted for, hence this new project. Uh, the other thing that the GASB had to consider was that there were some arrangements that were much more complicated than what Interpretation 2 gave credit for. So here's what happened with 91. It provides a new definition of conduit debt. Um, the first two prongs in this definition are the exact same from Interpretation 2. There is at least three parties. There's an issuer, there's an obligor, there's a debt holder. Uh, the second is that the issuer and the obligor are not within the same financial reporting framework uh, or financial reporting entity. Now, that's an important one to talk about because in the previous guidance, there was no accounting or financial reporting. So having that as part of the definition really did not 
cause anybody any problems. But what I have seen is sometimes there will be a government, a primary government with a component unit that is a uh, financing uh, authority or financing corporation who will issue debt uh, for the government, for the primary government, and they are part of the same financial reporting entity, and they're they're reporting or accounting for it as if it's conduit debt. This is saying that is not conduit debt, um, and if it's not conduit debt, then the issuer would, would be the one uh, reporting that liability. So that's an important distinction, important thing to think about, an important consequence of GASB 91. Uh, the other part of this definition that I'll point out is debt obligation is not a parity bond or cross uh, collateralized. So a lot of times governments will um, issue debt where the obligor is going to be several people, um, student loans, for example, or a single uh, family uh, mortgage loans. And all of those uh, obligors have the same rights and the same seniority, and then often they're, they're collateralized by the all, all collateralized by the same asset of the government. And in that case, those would not be considered conduit debt. And then the last two prongs on here, uh, the board recognizes that sometimes the obligor actually receives the funds and then passes it on, or, or the issuer receives the funds, pass it on to the obligor. But as long as the obligor is the ultimate recipient of the proceeds and is ultimately responsible, then it would meet this definition. Um, moving through this quickly, I realize, um, but there are a few things that make conduit debt more complicated than what um, is, is provided for in interpretation two. Um, the first thing I'll point out, it does provide the accounting um, guidance. Issuer does not recognize a conduit debt obligation as a liability. Um, and then there's also a um, uh, an indication that there are certain commitments that an issuer does uh, make sometimes. Sometimes these are just limited commitments, which is you know to maintain a tax exempt status. Sometimes it's much more involved uh, a pledge um, or a financial guarantee. And sometimes there's not a, a, a contractual commitment, but um, at the end of the day, the government chooses to uh, pay debt service payments. So it's a voluntary commitment. And those things do have some financial reporting impact. So um, if you have any of those, take a look and see what it tells you to do um, with regard to accounting for those commitments and disclosing those commitments. Uh, the other thing that GASB 91 addresses is uh, arrangements associated with conduit debt. A lot of times there's a capital asset that's being financed with that debt. And sometimes it's called a lease, like the contract is labeled lease, and it's not a lease if it meets the definition of a conduit debt. Um, and there are different scenarios that are addressed with the guidance on how to account for the financing of that capital asset. Um, GASB 91 also provides some disclosure requirements. Many of these are the same as what Interpretation 2 said, but understanding that sometimes an issuer provides for a financial guarantee, there is some, uh, some crossover. There are some uh, new disclosure requirements, which are going to be consistent with what we already see in GASB 70 for non-exchange financial guarantees, um, which is to, to indicate the, the amount of open guarantees that are out there. Um, the, the likelihood that um, payments will uh, be required to be made and that kind of thing. So with that, I'm going to um, pass the baton over to Jack so he can talk to us a bit about uh, Statement 94. Perfect. Thank you, Scott. So now we're looking at Statement 94, which covers public-private partnerships and public-public partnerships, P3s, and availability payment arrangements. Um, if we look at the next slide, it's important to note that, you know, a lot of what we learned when we implemented GASB 87 really created a template for GASB 94 and 96, and there's some consistent underlying concepts, um, a right to use asset, there's going to be a few others that, that we'll see later on. And GASB 94, it's really the marrying of uh, Statement 60 and Statement 87, and then uh, Statement 96, it's, you know, very similar to GASB 87. 87 scoped out intangible assets, so the statement's really picking it back up. And then it's also um, bringing in some guidance from Statement 51 regarding the software implementations. So as we look at the next slide, you can see a list here of the consistent underlying concepts between leases, P3s, and SPEDAs. Um, you'll notice on P3s that these contracts never transfer ownerships. So at the end of the contract term, the asset's always going to revert back to the, the transfer. And then you're also going to see there at the bottom underlying asset. That's something unique to P3s. And it really has to do with uh, an asset that's used to provide public services that you'll be considering as you go through the determinations on these contracts. So 
Looking at the definition of a P3, it's an arrangement in which a government, the transferor, so that's always a government. You can almost think about it as a lessor um, in terms of GASG 87 and what you might already know, um, with an operator, contracts with an operator to provide public services. So that operator can be a government or it can be an outside party. Um, and that's more like a, a lessee if we're thinking of terms in GASG 87 for the control of the right to operate or use a non-financial asset such as infrastructure, um, or other capital assets for a period of time, an exchange or exchange-like transaction. Um, so the main difference that you're going to see with this, with 94 that you didn't see in 87, it's that underlying asset, that infrastructure, other capital assets that has to be used to provide public services. That's what's going to kind of trigger you to, to evaluate these contracts um, for these P3 arrangements. And GASB 94, is a, it's a really good pronouncement. There's some you know great illustrations that highlight common examples of P3s. You know, such as roads, bridges, airport terminals, public transit, hospitals, student services for dorms, those type of things. Now, looking at the, the next slide, you can see here service concession arrangements. So what Statement 94 did is it superseded Statement 60, which covered service concession arrangements. So, you know, that definition that we had for these service concession arrangements in GASB 60 was really too narrow. Um, it didn't you know, discuss or identify all of the different um, intricacies that can be in these P3 arrangements. So, you know, it's going to have more guidance in 94, but when you're looking at service concession arrangements, it's really going to be um, very similar to GASB 60. A lot of that same information is um, brought over from that standard. And, you know, when we're looking at a service concession arrangement um, compared to the P3, you know, it's really the key differentiator is the, the transfer, the government, has the ability to modify or approve what services the operator is required to provide. So the government has a lot more um, control over you know, the services that are gonna be provided, who they can be provided to, and then the rates that are charged in those. So you know, kind of unique to a service concession arrangement when you're, you're considering those. And next, the, the standard also discuss um, availability payment arrangements. So, um, you know, it's an arrangement in which a government compensates an operator for activities that may include designing, constructing, financing, maintaining, or operating an underlying financial asset for a period of time in exchange or exchange-like transaction. So the government's compensating an operator. Um, those payments are really based solely on the availability for use of that underlying asset, but the government itself is gonna retain um, all the demand risk and all the responsibility for fee collection for that underlying asset. So I think that there's probably a lot more of these out there than maybe um, people have thought initially when they looked at the standard, that you might be in these contracts to where, you know, some sort of a uh, vendor is being compensated to provide some sort of, um, um, you know, a service or, or operate something, you know, like a, a parking garage, or um, it could be any number of things. And just one thing I wanna highlight here is an APA can contain multiple components, especially when we're looking at designing and constructing um, an asset that's going to be used to provide public services. So, you know, that compared to maintaining it, um, you might have different components with, um, you know, the same entity or third party. So it's important to, to read those, understand it, and then break those out when you can, because the accounting treatment will look a little bit different. And that'll bring us to polling question number two. How many arrangements do you have that are impacted by GASB 94? Several, more than 10. B, a few less than 10, C, none, or D, I don't know, I haven't thought about it yet. While we're waiting for those responses, I did want to point out, as you said, Jack, yeah, I think a lot of people do have these APAs without really realizing that they fall under GASB 94. Uh, the good news is it's not a complicated accounting uh, requirement form. Um, you recognize the outflows in the period in which they apply. Um, the reason why 94 put that definition in there was just to make it clear that those types of arrangements are not the P3s that we're talking about. All right. Maybe we can go ahead and share the results of the poll. Yep, and the, the I don't know yet, I haven't thought about it. So um, gathering these contracts, evaluating, really important. You know, if you're, you're a 630 government um, and the 930 and um, 
yeah, we've we've looked at quite a few of these. They can be kind of unique and, and vary from contract to contract. So definitely allocating the time to start pulling these together is a good recommendation. All right, so now we'll look at statement 96, subscription-based IT arrangements or SPEDAs. Um, so this is, you know, a, a, a topic that you've probably seen some CPE webinars on already. Um, and uh, if you look at the next slide, we've done two recordings that are, you know, available. Um, we'll send out the slide deck after this, and um, they're kind of embedded there in the links, or you can find them on our, our webpage. So um, really recommend taking a look at those. The first training we did um, was an hour, and it really goes over the the standard in depth. Um, but the the second training I think is is really helpful. Um, you know, I've probably helped on 30 of these implementations so far and looked at probably well over a thousand speedas. Um, and that presentation's, you know, really based on the the top 10 challenges that go into implementing this standard. A lot of the questions that you're gonna have um, that are based on, you know, real world experience and, um, you know, based on what we've seen talking to auditors and and looking at a lot of these contracts. So I highly recommend that that part two training if you you feel comfortable around the the basics. I think it's it's unique in that it doesn't just tell you what the standard says. It's based on you know what what we've actually seen in practice. And the definition of a, a speeda, um, I'm just going to highlight. I think that it's it's important to to read this and know this and have this around when you're looking at contracts. Gasby was really intentional in putting this definition together. I think when you're looking at the facts and circumstances of your um, contracts, you can really return back to this definition. Um, and apply it, and it's going to help you answer a lot of questions. So it's a contract that conveys control of the right to use another party's IT software. And Gatsby doesn't actually define what software is. It was left broad intentionally. Alone or in combination with tangible capital assets as specified in the contract for a period of time. So that period of time is important. You know, the standards looking at you know, contracts that have end dates, right? So not perpetual agreements that um, you own the, the rights to forever, but but something with an end and date an exchange or exchange like transaction. I think the exchange or exchange like transaction, we're going to see very few um, that don't meet that. You know, it's not going to be the same with Gatsby 87, where you have $1 leases. Um, you know, you're contracting with these vendors for software for profit entities. So, you know, typically those are exchange transactions. Um, but yeah, if you need more information on that, um, we definitely do a, a deeper dive in those, those two earlier recordings. So um, I would recommend definitely take a look at that. Yeah, we de we purposely did not take do a deep dive because of all the time we've spent already with Gatsby 96. Um, many of you on here probably are sick of hearing us talk about it, um, but those resources are available. And, and with any of these guidances, anytime we get a lot of questions, uh, we do put together a full uh, hour long webinar just on that guidance. So um, the next one is a Gatsby Statement 99. I've seen a lot um, this last year where financial statements say that um, Gatsby 99 has been implemented. Uh, just wanted to point out that the effective date of 99 um, is varied. Uh, certain provisions were effective immediately. Certain were are effective this year. And then some of them are effective next year. So just to highlight, if there ever is a standard that can and maybe should be implemented early. Um, I would say Gatsby 99, just because it makes it so much easier. Um, the uh, you know starting from the bottom here, the technical updates and the corrections that was effective immediately. Same with the extended use of LIBOR, which related to using LIBOR as a benchmark rate um, when applying Gatsby 53. Um, uh, the uh, LIBOR administrator had. Um, uh, modified or extended the use of LIBOR uh, until uh, June 30th. Um, this guidance was was put in, in there in order to, to provide for the, the continued use of LIBOR until LIBOR changed their methodology, which they have done. And Gatsby just put out a, a public uh, notice that LIBOR is no longer an effective uh, uh, benchmark interest rate. Um, leases, uh, P3s, and SPEDAs, um, are all addressed in 99, a certain amendments that are going to be effective this year. We'll talk more about that in a second. And then the other two financial guarantees, specifically exchange or exchange like financial guarantees, and then other derivative instruments, um, meaning derivative instruments that you entered into in order to hedge a specified risk, yet it either 
initially or no longer is effective at hedging that risk. Um, would meet this definition of other derivative instruments. And so this guidance provides um, uh, for how you would um, recognize the changes in fair values in your flow statements. So if you don't have derivative instruments, if you don't have these exchange financial guarantees, this will be the easy one just to go ahead and, and adopt uh, this year if you haven't already. Um, again, uh, there are some amendments related to leases, P3s, and SPEDAs. Um, some of these amendments came from uh, implementing 87. Some of the questions that were asked resulted in um, a, 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 a desire by the board to clear some things up, and that's what the omnibus generally is for. And so there's some, uh, it touches the, the, the term, um, the short-term exception, uh, some remeasurement uh, and variable payment uh, inconsistencies, um, incentives, and the underlying asset for P3. So take a look at that. Um, I don't think any of these are going to cause anybody heartburn, but it just clarifies some of the guidance from those standards. I next want to get into GASB Statement 100. And I just got done saying that if ever there was a statement that you can early implement, 99 would be it. Um, I would say the same thing for GASB Statement 100, uh, because it's not every year that a government has an accounting change or an error correction. Um, and But when you do have it, this guidance makes it more clear. It's a little bit easier to follow in my mind than GASB Statement 62. And often when I get asked the question, I appeal to 100. I'm already looking at 100 for the right answer. Um, because it's not changing what 62 says, it's adding to it and clarifying it. And, and I think it's actually much more useful and easier to follow. So I would recommend uh, to all my clients to go ahead and implement 100 uh, for the upcoming year, even though it's not effective until next year. Um, one thing that changed from 62 is the term prior period adjustment does not show up anywhere in here. Uh, and if you if you are familiar with 62, prior period adjustment was actually the name of that section of the standard um, yeah, prior period adjustment is not a very good descriptor. I mean, what's it doesn't tell you why it's being adjusted. Is it an error correction? Is it a, a new accounting pronouncement? Um, whatever. And uh, and some of the things, such as a change in estimate, doesn't even result in a prior period adjustment. So it wasn't a very good descriptor. They've taken that completely out. Um, another thing that's changed is in this third category where we see change to or within the financial reporting entity. The previous guidance did not have the within the financial reporting entity. So it provides a little bit more guidance. Uh, accounting uh, or a change in accounting principle is a change from one accepted principle to another principle. It also includes the implementation of a new pronouncement. Um, so consequently, all guidance going forward will no longer have its own transition guidance. It will reference to GASB 100 for how to implement a new pronouncement. Um, retroactive is the default. Uh, so unless they decide not to do retroactive, uh, it's it, it'll, it'll they'll, they'll add more description for that whatever guidance that is. Change in accounting estimate is also defined. Um, note that there's two aspects to an accounting estimate. There's the methodology that's used, and there's the inputs that go into it. Uh, the inputs is what we're talking about here with a change in accounting estimate because the change in methodology is really more of a change in accounting principle. And then we've got change to or within the financial reporting entity addition or removal of a fund, the change in fund presentation from major to non-major or vice versa, change in component unit, um, and, and, and all that. And one thing I want to point out that I think is very important is it makes it a little bit more clear. This is in 62, but it's more apparent that anytime you do make a change, a voluntary change in an accounting principle or in an estimate, you must justify it um, uh, based on the qualitative characteristics of financial reporting, which I've listed off here. Um, the GASB actually uses these as well. Uh, they cannot issue a new pronouncement unless they have come to a conclusion that it will uh, improve collectively the qualitative characteristics of financial reporting. Uh, you have to keep in mind that when you do change an accounting principle, you are adversely impacting the, uh, the consistency Right. So that's that's a qualitative characteristic. And so you have to overcome that by uh, improving even more the other uh, characteristics. And so I would expect that when a client of mine or, an, or a preparer is changing, they've got some sort of white paper or some sort of justification where they are taking into account these uh, qualify these characteristics in order to justify the change. Um, so how do you account for them? What, how do you do a, a, an accounting change? Uh, accounting a change in accounting principle should be applied retroactively, um, and a change in accounting estimate should be prospectively 
and then a change to or within the financial reporting entity should be uh, reported by adjusting the current reporting period's beginning balance as if the change occurred as of the beginning of the year. Um, I don't think any of that is going to set any set the world on fire. That that's pretty consistent with I think how a lot of us have thought about it. Um, there are some disclosure requirements. The nature of the change should be disclosed, um, and the reason for the change. And then, if the prior periods are not restated because it's not practicable, uh, the reason why. Um, by the way, practicable is not the same thing as practical. It's a it's a higher threshold, higher hurdle you got to cross uh, in order to uh, say that it's not practicable to uh, to restate. Uh, to me, this is the best news from GASB 100 is it actually provides some guidance on what to do with RSI and SI, which is lacking in 62. A lot of us has kind of followed this, you know, when we implemented the, the pension standards, what do we do with those comparative years in our MDNA? And a lot of folks have just not restated those prior years, added a little asterisk and a note saying why it's not as comparable or not consistent. And the good news is GASB believes that's the way it should be done. Um, so that's what the guidance says with the accounting change. You do not change any of the prior period information that are listed in the RSI or SI. Uh, next, we talk about error corrections, uh, mathematical mistakes, mistakes in the application of accounting principles, the oversight or misuse of facts that existed at the time. So facts that existed at the time that could reasonably be expected to have been obtained and taken into account. So it's a, still a little bit hard to get your hands around, but uh, the, the point is, if you should have known it and uh, and you didn't, maybe, maybe you didn't know it because you didn't try hard enough to know it, uh, that's an error correction. Um, a change from a non-GAAP principle to a GAAP principle is an error correction. So uh, that's what the guidance says. And error corrections are to be accounted for retroactively by restating the beginning net position. Um, it has its disclosure requirements, the nature of the error and the correction. Um, and this is going to be different with RSI, SI. Uh, the board believes if there is an error, how can you not fix it? So yeah, RSI, SI, you do have to go back and fix prior years if it's to correct an error. And the last thing to point out, um, other reporting requirements, uh, some governments already do this. When you have an error correction or, 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 excuse me, a prior period adjustment on the face of the statements, you should show the aggregate amount of the adjustment of beginning that position. Um, and I've seen that done. Um, I've seen others not do it and just show it in the notes. Uh, this requires you to show it on the face of the statements, as well as a note in a tabular format to show the effect of the change or correction. Um, and then the notes should be made at the reporting unit level. All right. So with that, and, and maybe this polling question is misplaced a little bit, but it goes back to GASB 99. Um, which GASB 99 topic seems most relevant, financial guarantees, other derivative instruments, amendments to 87, 94, 96, or the LIBOR update? Give you a few more minutes to answer that. I will tell you that at the GASB, the LIBOR update was the one that was met with the most urgency because 99 was issued about three months after the original GASB 93 deadline had expired. And so there was basically three months without the guidance on whether or not that benchmark interest rate could be used. All right. And so it looks like for many of us, amendments to 87, 94, and 96 is the most relevant, which makes sense to me, I think. Um, given that we are in the process of implementing 94 and 96. All right, and I'll pass the baton back over to Jack, talk about GASB Statement 101. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. So um, Statement 101, compensated absences, really came about from a re-examination of Statement 16, um, which was issued, you know, 30 years ago. And um, when they re-examined it, you know, several issues were found. Probably one of the, the biggest was there's just different types of leave today um, that, that maybe, you know, didn't exist back at that time. And then, um, you know, it really brings in this concept of using a, a principle-based approach when applying um, the standard. So 
Um, it's a little bit different in that principle-based approach. And if we look at the definition, um, you know, first the standard on the next slide um, defines what compensated absences is, and then um, identifies some recognition principles to be applied to that. So a compensated absence is def defined as leave for which employees may receive cash benefits when leave is used for time off. Other payments, such as payments for unused leave upon termination or non-cash settlements um, or conversion to defined benefit plans. Examples for this include, you know, a lot of things that we're used to, vacation, sick, paid time off, holiday leave, paternal leave, military leave and bereavement, um, and certain types of sabbatical leave. Important thing to note here, it doesn't include sabbatical leave, which uh, an employer is required to perform duties of a different nature for the government. So important to kind of look at what you're calling sabbatical leave. If you have an employee that's just transferring to another department or performing a, a different function for a short period of time, that wouldn't you know, necessarily qualify as sabbatical leave um, you know, under this statement 101. And then termination benefits, we're still gonna be applying GASB statement 47. Um, no change to that, and, and it's not encompassed in, in this standard. So, you know, once you've defined what your, your compensated absence is, the next piece related to the standard is you go to the, the recognition criteria. Um, so there's three recognition criteria to be applied to all leave, and there are a few exceptions, which we'll talk about, but basically the leave must be attributed to services rendered. It must uh, accumulate, and it must be more likely than not to be used or paid. Um, important to note that vesting is not a recognition criterion. So some governments offer sick leave that vests over time or doesn't vest at all. The non-vested portion of the sick leave would not be paid out at termination. In statement 16, this really affected the amount of the compensated absence liability, but the GASB board decided that vesting should not be a recognition criteria. Um, and if the leave can be carried forward to a future reporting period, it would represent a present obligation. Whether or not it'll actually be paid out would be considered in the probability assessment in that third recognition criteria that you're seeing there. And, um, and just note with that, with regard to the probability assessments, um, the threshold that they use here is more likely than not, which we're seeing as you know becoming the favorite threshold of the board. Um, you know, primarily because it provi provides a, a more precise definition. So statement 16 used that threshold of probable. Um, you know, and the board was was worried that that might be viewed as too high of a threshold um, and it could result in you know, understatement of the liability. And like I said, there are some exceptions to this, so I'll just cover them. Um, leave that would be settled through conversion to a defined benefit plan should not be accrued. And that's because that, that pension or OPEB liability should have already accounted for it. Um, leave that is dependent upon a sporadic event that affects you know, a small um, portion of employees so that could be your, your paternal leave or military leave or, or jury duty would not be recognized until the, the leave actually commences. And then uh, you can imagine the difficulty that might ensue by measuring an unlimited leave liability. So the board decided that it's better to, to exclude that type of leave from the recognition criteria and only recognize leave um, as it is used, meaning it wouldn't be accrued. So same with holiday leave. There was some discussion as to whether holiday leave would be based on services rendered. Um, but, you know, since governments handle that so differently, rather than have the, the debate play out across all these different governments, the board included it as an exception where it would not be accrued and only recognized once it is used. All right, so let's move on now from um, projects being, or standards being implemented to current GASB projects. And the first one that we want to talk about is this project on certain risk disclosures. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, FASB topic 275 on risks and uncertainties was something that the board considered and decided not to include in GASB 62. They did not adopt it when they did, when they did the other uh, FASB pronouncements. Uh, the reason why is they thought they needed some more time to take it and really um, think about it in terms of the government environment as to whether or not it applies. And if you are uh, familiar with, with um, FASB topic 275, it's got four categories of risk, nature of operations, the use of estimates and the preparation of financial statements, certain significant estimates, and current vulnerabilities due to certain concentrations. And so this board went through each of those to decide if there are any of those that should be carried forward related to the government environment. Um, some of you might be surprised to know that um, 
there are disclosures that are commonly found in government financial statements that are actually as a result of, of FASB topic 275 that don't really relate. You know, my favorite one is this use of estimates disclosure. The preparation of financial statements require management to make a number of estimates and assumptions, blah, 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 blah. Actual results could differ from those estimates. Well, I see that all the time. Uh, GASB does not require such a disclosure. Um, GFOA doesn't require it. It's not in the guidance. It's something that kind of spilled over from, from FASB. Um, same with concentrations. Concentrations are not something that are required to be disclosed at the moment. Um, and the, the board is really trying to do is they want first to avoid boilerplate disclosures such as those, uh, but provide in essential information to users of the financial statements regarding the types of risk that government face. Um, everybody on the board is in complete agreement with that objective. Uh, but it's been very interesting to, to watch them deliberate in order to come up with how exactly you achieve that result. To no boilerplate disclosures, only essential information disclosed. And the general principle of this, and, and I'll say that there, the exposure draft has been, you know, it's been exposed. It's been, the comp period has ended. They've re-deliberated. This will be issued sometime uh, this, this calendar year. Um, and they've made changes from the exposure draft, but the general principle stays the same, which is that there are certain conditions that exist, which when you combine those conditions with an event, either has occurred or will soon occur, then there is a, an effect on a government's ability to provide services or to meet its obligations. And that's really what we're trying to get to the bottom to bottom of. So, um, we understand or the GASB, the board understands that governments face lots of risks. Um, you can list for pages and pages of disclosures, all the risks that they uh, that they have, that they face. Uh, but this is going to narrow it down to two specific types of risks or conditions. Uh, conditions actually is a better word. Um, the first condition is um, a concentration. Um, condition is um, by the way, defined as uh, something that limits the ability to acquire resources or control spending. Um, concentration would be the first one, which is defined as the lack of diversity related to an aspect of a significant revenue source or expense. Um, I think a lot of governments have concentrations. Um, think of a government that um, is highly dependent on an industry, the auto industry, tourism, uh, where if that industry were to go under, they would be in, there'd be some, some issues, some uh, problems funding their, the operations. Um, same with uh, principal employers and, and all that. And so governments tend to know when they have these concentrations. It's not uh, a requirement to disclose that they have these concentrations, but it's when you have that concentration accompanied by a specific event that's going to result in there being a, a, an effect on the government's ability. Uh, the other condition is constraint um, that is imposed on the government. These are not self-imposed constraints. Um, limitations on raising revenue. Think of a property tax ceiling that they can't um, they can't change or modify. Uh, limitations on spending. Uh, limitations on debt. The uh, debt ceiling um, or mandated. Sp uh, spending. The EPA uh, passes down something that they've got to implement and they don't get funding to implement it and they got to do it within their current resources. That kind of thing is what, what we're talking about. Now, the big discussion, the deliberations have mostly been around this, the limitations, the likelihood, what the likelihood of an event occurring, should it be reasonably possible? Should it be probable? There, there's, there's a lot of discussion around that. And then also the likelihood of the impact. The significant impact, should it be a reasonably possible? Should it be probable of the impact? Uh, timing was also a big discussion item. Should it be um, uh, the event has to occur in the next year, the next three years? The impact has to be felt in the next couple of years. Um, and then magnitude, um, how significant should that impact be before it gets disclosed? And so you can tell that this is one where there's going to be a lot of judgment to implement. It's going to cause a lot of questions, a lot of um, uh, maybe uncertainty in, in governments having to apply this. And the board certainly spent a lot of time trying to come up with the best answer. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong. It's it's what's best. And that's what they've been trying to arrive at. Now, we are a little behind in our schedule. We're going to move through this a little quickly. But the next one that I want to talk about is the financial reporting improvements. Now, if you are a GASB groupie, uh, you're one of those who watch all of the board meetings uh, you might know that in uh, last month's board meeting, they made a tentative decision 
to take out the part of that exposure draft that I think caused the most attention, uh, the presentation of governmental fund financial statements. It was just becoming so hard to, to make it work. And, and just the, the background there, um, there's not really a way to come up with a conceptual answer for government fund financial statements. Lots of users um, really value that, that shorter term focus of the government funds but if it's not full accrual or if it's not full cash, then it's never going to be conceptual. It's going to be a rules-based uh, uh, concept. And so uh, arriving at what those specific rules have been has been pretty difficult. And in fact, I think in the exposure draft, uh, the provisions in there passed with a 4-3 vote, which never makes anybody feel uh, very warm and fuzzy. And so they made the decision to carve that part out. Um, I think a lot of people um, will will are, are happy about that, but they are not just throwing it in the wastebasket. It may end up being its own project later um, because there are some things about the current guidance that can be improved upon to make that information use, more useful. Um, the financial reporting framework also talks a variety of other topics um, that I have listed here. Um, presentation of the proprietary funds, I think, is is one that also gets a lot of attention. Um, the current guidance does not give you a lot of information on how to arrive at operating revenue or expense, um, whereas the, this, this new guidance will give you a more specific definition. Um, operating revenue and expense would be defined as revenue or expense other than non-operating, but then it does give you the definition of non-operating, uh, which is described as subsidies received and provided, revenue and expenses related to financing, uh, resources from the disposal of capital assets or inventory or investment income and expense um, or contributions to a permanent return endowment. So it's not one of those things and it's going to be in operating. Um, so I think uh, some some might, may not like everything about that definition, but at least there's a consistent definition that all governments have to follow instead of it just being an individual government's policy. Um, the other thing I will point out on this is that the budgetary comparison schedules um, currently, you can have them either in RSI or they can be part of your basic financial statements. GASB 34 encourages them to be as part of RSI, um, but a lot of governments do put them in their basic financial statements. Um, in fact, in my state that I'm in now, in North Carolina, I think that's the requirement for them to be part of the basic financial statements. Um, the board uh, in the, the current tentative decisions uh, say that no longer are they going to be part of the basic financial statements, but they should be part of RSI. Um, so that's another change that you should be aware of as that standard um, comes about, I think, early next year. And uh, the next one, uh, classification of non-financial assets. Um, and this one, I think we're going to see an exposure draft very soon. Um, the problem with what's currently happening is there is a definition of financial assets uh, that we find in GASB 72, um, and that's described as cash, evidence of ownership interest in an equity or a contract that conveys to one entity a right to receive cash or another financial instrument or exchange for other financial instruments on potentially favorable terms. It's kind of a long definition, but there's really not a definition of non-financial asset, and that term non-financial asset is used all the time. In fact, it was mentioned in some of these definitions of you know, a P3 um, uses the term non-financial asset. Well, is the non-financial asset anything that's not a financial asset, or are we really talking about capital assets? Um, the guys we saw in the pre-agenda research that there was a lot of differences in how governments were reporting um, some of these, uh, especially capital assets such as land held for sales. Should that be part of capital assets? Should it be in its own category? Huge variability in how that was being uh, presented. And so this is a... Uh, uh, this project is clearly is, is, is only going to be talking about whether or not to define certain terms and how things should be presented. So it's not going to be much any more complicated than that. This is just a practice issue project. Now looking at uh, revenue and expense recognition, um, this is probably a topic there's so much information about we could do several hours on, but we'll just kind of touch on you know some of the highlights. Um, so. You know, I think it's important to note um, this is a GASB update, so we'll let you know what's currently going on. But but what brought about this standard? So um, you know what we have is is really old, and the existing guidance is pretty limited. 
around revenue and expense recognition. We've got GASB 33, um, which is covering your, your non-exchange transactions. Um, we have 36, which talks about some shared revenues and then um, you know provides some guidance for that, that paragraph 16 in statement 33, which is the, the one paragraph that we have that really talks about those exchange-like transactions. Um, and then, you know, the last thing really done was in 2010, GASB 62 was issued to provide some additional guidance. Um, and then, you know, meanwhile, on the FASB side, right, we've seen them issue topic 606 um, and really establish a, a framework or performance obligation model for revenue recognition. So, you know, what GASB has done um, is they, you know, have done some done some research. Uh, they had an invitation to comment all the way back in, you know, 2015, really kind of laying out three potential concepts that could be used. So, you know, using a exchange or non-exchange like model, um, similar kind of to what we have now, a performance obligation approach, you know, kind of like what FASB is using or a, a third model, which combines the two, kind of a, um, a hybrid model. Um, and what they've, you know, found out with that is, you know, existing exchange, non-exchange model, it could be inconsistent. Um, there's a subjective notion that could go in like the value of the transaction. And it's possible that it could be categorized differently just based on that subjective determination. Um, and then, you know, using purely a performance or non-performance obligation approach, it, uh, it can be complex and it may not address all transactions, um, you know, with governments being kind of unique um, in the, the type of transactions that they had. So it really brought about, you know, um, this preliminary views um, that was issued in June of 2020. Um, really great document, pretty thorough. It's eight chapters, chapters one and two, if you want to do some additional research after this, provide a good yeah, overview. And then there's an appendix in the back that um, gives some really good examples. But really kind of three important things were laid out um, that the, you know, revenue and expense um, transactions are going to be categorized. Um, the binding arrangement is kind of the, the terminology being used now. So you'll have type A transactions, which kind of follow performance obligation and type B transactions. Um, which you know involve like a satisfaction of, of time requirement. So once you categorize it, then there'll be a you know recognition, um, how those get recognized, you know, recording an asset or deferred outflow, um, and then measurement, you know, when when that's going to take place. Um, so since then, there's been um, you know some redeliberate redeliberation on this, um, and the boards tentatively agreed to um, no longer identify grants subject to eligibility requirements as category A transactions. So that's just something kind of new that came out since this um, preliminary views. You know, it closely resembled performance obligations that made it look like it might follow a type A approach um, more consistently, but they've decided that um, that's not the case. And then, you know, the board's meeting later this week, um, revenue recognition is, is one of the, the topics on the, the agenda. Um, looks like they're probably gonna cover category B transactions. Um, Kind of look at purpose restrictions or eligibility requirements and time requirements related to to grants on that. So um, this is a good one to follow. You know we're we're far from it being ready to be um, you know out there and implemented, but um, this could be a big change to to kind of how we do things potentially. So keep your eyes out on this one. And then next, going concern uncertainties and severe financial stress. So just to briefly touch on this. Um, you know, governments really don't go out of business. So it's difficult to um, apply going concern. There's been a really a diversity in practice um, related to this. So, you know, the, the objectives of this project is really to um, consider, you know, improvements to existing guidance. Um, it introduces this idea of um, severe financial stress and then, you know, how that could be applied and what kind of disclosures that might relate to. Um, yep, I think we covered all those bullet points there. So we're kind of coming towards the end of time. So I'll make sure that Scott, Scott has the ability to talk about infrastructure next. Sorry about that. I was slow moving the slides. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so infrastructure assets is um, the newest project. Um, not very, not very old. Um, Pre-agenda research on capital assets revealed that um, there is some improvements that can be made to how infrastructure assets are reported. Um, if you think about a, a big government that's got a vast network of roads and bridges and sewer systems, and it's really hard to tell from looking at the financial statements 
what what how the, the, the condition of those infrastructure assets when they need to be replaced you could have part of the city with with pristine infrastructure and the other part of it is is you know it's crumbling and needs to be replaced with a huge um, uh, financial investment soon and you really can't tell that from the financial statements when the board adopted this uh, they adopted it as a major project, not just a practice issue. And so that tells me that they're going to spend a lot of time on this. And what I thought was going to happen was that they were going to decide that what we now consider the modified approach would be the approach. Um, not a lot of governments use the modified approach. Um, so just a reminder of what the modified approach is to infrastructure. It's you expense the cost that you pay to upkeep your infrastructure but you have a condition assessment performed every couple of years and that you know your RSI shows the results of that condition assessment. So the idea being as long as you maintain your infrastructure at a specific condition, then you just expense the costs that are incurred to preserve that condition. Um, the board in the first board meeting, they, they provided a definition of infrastructure assets, um, not, no surprises with what that definition is. Um, and then they determined that infrastructure assets should continue to be recognized in financial statements. If you are any of you are pre gasby 34 uh, people, you'll know that infrastructure assets didn't always get reported in the financial statements. That 34 is what added those in. Um, and then the last part, infrastructure assets should continue to be measured using the historical cost appreciation approach with an allowance for governments to elect to use the preservation method. So that's still what, what we do today. That's that's basically historical cost and then our modified approach. The problem that the board had with the modified approach is there is not really a standard. You know, you get engineers out there to, to do these condition assessments, but they don't have clear standards on how they arrive at their conclusions, like you do with these, you know, these actuarial reports we use for pensions. Um, so how how do you really rely on, on those condition reports? And so that the, because of that, they decided they could not go full on with this preservation method. With that said, being that they they decided that historical cost uh, depreciation approach is the, the the default approach, I think they are going to spend some time deliberating on whether or not there should be specific depreciation guidance on how you then depreciate from the historical cost. And so there, this is a lot of can't wait to see what the board is going to decide um, because I think they are planning some some big things. They want to make some big improvements with how infrastructure is being reported with governments. So that concludes our slides, but we do have one final polling question for you. Um, we spend a lot of time helping clients um, in uh, implement guidance. Um, and, and Jack is one of those who many of you have, have talked to. He spends a lot of time with 96 this year. Would you like further uh, connect with Cherry Becker regarding any of the topics discussed today? Uh, yes, maybe in the future. No, you can be honest. Won't hurt our feelings. Uh, we'd just like to, to see where you guys are and, and whether or not we can be helpful to you as you implement this new, these new guidance. And as you answer that, I know that there's been a lot of uh, chat. I don't. I'm not very good at monitoring the chat as I'm as I'm talking, but I know Danny has been uh, responding to some questions. Um, any questions that did not get um, responded to, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I have no problem with with taking those questions offline, especially as it deals with certain facts and circumstances of your situations. So. Um, Here's our, our contact information um, for you to, to reach out to us if you need to. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott and Jack. That was great. Um, so this concludes our, our first session. Thank you again uh, to all of you who joined us. As, as Scott mentioned, we answered a decent amount of your questions live. But if you have additional questions regarding to uh, today's topic, you can see uh, Scott and Jack's email on there. They're also um, pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, we value your feedback, so we ask that you take part in a short survey, which is now going to be posted in the meeting chat. Our next webinar, which is leading a government finance and accounting function following the great resignation, uh, will begin in about 10 minutes at 1040 Eastern. So we really hope to see you there. Uh, Lauren and I will be uh, presenting that. 
Uh, to get there, please click the link on the confirmation email that you receive from Zoom, particularly for uh, that next session. Uh, give you a nice little 10 minute uh, stretch break, you know, get to some emails and uh, we'll see you back. Thank you so much.